Today is February 12th, 2023, and uh, the title for my Tay Show today is It's Okay to Suffer. <clears throat> of course, suffering, as I think everybody knows, is the first of the Four Noble Truths, the first uh, sermon that the Buddha uh, delivered after his Great Awakening. Suffering is also one of the three characteristics of existence <clears throat> that the Buddha laid out. Suffering, impermanence, and no self. <clears throat> Dukkha. Uh, what, is, what is impermanence? <laughs> Go ahead, speak up. Anicca. Anicca, yeah. That's no self, I think. No, anatta. 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 Thank you. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> um, I want to read a little something from Bodhidharma, the founder of the Zen school. He said this, Everyone who has a body is an heir to suffering and a stranger to peace. Having comprehended this point, the wise are detached from all things of the phenomenal world with their minds free of desires and craving. As the sutra has it, all sufferings spring from attachment. True joy arises from detachment. To know clearly the bliss of detachment is to walk on the path of the Tao. This is the rule of non-attachment. <clears throat> So Bodhidharma said this some 15, 1600 years ago. This is not what we're taught in society growing up. <clears throat> we're taught to avoid suffering any way possible. <clears throat> We're taught that we don't have time for the pain. Even, even a good psychotherapist may buy into the strategy of preventing our bad feelings and chasing after our good ones. And when we do that, we're looking past the reality of our life as it is right now. And we're concerning ourselves with what's going to come. And... <clears throat> probably not a new idea to many people here in the Zendo, but it's, uh, it's just mind-boggling how hard it is to get this to sink in. It's, it's so habitual when we feel the slightest twinge of discomfort to sort of squirm away, because it's what we've always done. <clears throat> spoke last week about uh, DBT, dialectical behavior therapy, and uh, <clears throat> the idea of radical acceptance. It's easy to talk about. It's very hard to do. It's a practice. It's a lot of what our practice, our Zen practice, is about. <clears throat> Opening up to the way things are even when it doesn't feel so great. I'm going to read a little uh, selection from uh, one of the bad boys of early Zen. Not sure if I ever heard a good word about uh, Alan Watts. <laughs> I'm sure at this moment Roshi Kaplo is spinning in his grave. <laughs> Um, and, and for, you know, for, for some good reasons. Um, but let me first say what I like about Alan Watts, and, and that's that this guy convinced me that there was, that Zen was for real. Uh, it just, he took an intellectual 20-year-old, which was what I was when I first read any of his work, and convinced me that the way I'd been looking at the world 
was wrong, that it was different. It was, it was mind-blowing to, to come on that. And uh, I, think, I think a lot of other people have been helped by some of what he wrote. Uh, the criticism, if you're wondering, of Alan Watts is that uh, you, could, you could argue that it stays on an intellectual level, that he's not so concerned with how we can actually uh, make real in our own bodies and minds <clears throat> the philosophy, let's say, uh, the truth that he's talking about. Nevertheless, um, it's a really nice presentation, and especially for the whole issue of anxiety, uh, casting our minds into the future, looking for problems, and as a result, uh, leaving <clears throat> our real life, the life of this moment, behind. Just going to pick and choose a few things. This is from an article. Um, I found this on a website, uh, sort of a blog. It's been going on, I guess, for maybe 15 or 20 years. <clears throat> a woman named Maria Popova, and the site is called The Marginalian. Uh, and this is an article about Alan Watts. It's called An Antidote to the Age of Anxiety, Alan Watts on Happiness and How to Live with Presence. <clears throat> she says, Watts argues that the root of our human frustration and daily anxiety is our tendency to live for the future, which is an abstraction. And Alan Watts writes, if to enjoy even an enjoyable present, we must have the assurance of a happy future, <clears throat> we are crying for the moon. We have no such assurance. The best predictions are still matters of probability rather than certainty. And to the best of our knowledge, every one of us is going to suffer and die. If then, we cannot live happily without an assured future, we are certainly not adapted to living in a finite world where, despite the best plans, accidents will happen and where death comes at the end. <clears throat> I look <clears throat> at myself and I, I, I resonate with that uh, reluctance to relax into a happy present if I'm worried about something in the offing. And yet, my direct experience is only this moment. This moment may include my anxieties about the future, <clears throat> but that future that I imagine, that's not there. It's just my imaginings. Watts says, the primary consciousness, the basic mind which knows reality rather than ideas about it, does not know the future. It lives completely in the present and perceives nothing more than what is at this moment. The ingenious brain, however, looks at that part of present experience called memory and by studying it is able to make predictions. These predictions are relatively accurate and reliable enough, for instance, everyone will die, that the future assumes a high degree of reality, so high that the present loses its value. <clears throat> but the future is still not here and cannot be a part of experienced reality until it is present. Since what we know of the future is made up of purely abstract and logical elements, inferences, guesses, deductions, it cannot be eaten, felt, smelled, seen, heard, or otherwise enjoyed. To pursue it is to pursue a constantly retreating phantom, and the faster you chase it, the faster it runs ahead. This is why all the affairs of civilization are rushed, why hardly anyone enjoys what he has and is forever seeking more and more. Happiness then will consist 
not of solid and substantial realities, but such abstract and superficial things as promises, hopes, and assurances. <clears throat> As I recall, Barack Obama's first presidential campaign was <clears throat> centered around hope. It's a lot here, and I'm not going to read it all. He says uh, further on, further on, recognizing that the experience of presence is the only experience is also a reminder that our I doesn't exist beyond this present moment, that there is no permanent, static, and immutable self which can grant us any degree of security and certainty for the future. And yet, we continue to grasp for precisely that assurance of the future which remains an abstraction. Actually, this is not Watts. Excuse me, this is this Maria Popova. <clears throat> our only chance for awakening from this vicious cycle, Watts argues, is to bring full awareness to our present experience, something very different from judging it, evaluating it, or measuring it up against some arbitrary or abstract ideal. <clears throat> and he writes, there is a contradiction in wanting to be perfectly secure in a universe whose very nature is momentariness and fluidity. <clears throat> You'll notice we've gotten in the other two uh, characteristics of existence here, the non-existence of the I and the changeability of everything. A universe whose very nature is momentariness and fluidity. But the contradiction lies a little deeper than the mere conflict between the desire for security and the fact of change. If I want to be secure, that is, protected from the flux of life, I am wanting to be separate from life. Yet it is this very sense of separateness which makes me feel insecure. To be secure means to isolate and fortify the I, but this is just the feeling of being an isolated I, which makes me feel lonely and afraid. In other words, the more security I can get, the more I shall want. <clears throat> we could also say the more I chase it, the more I won't get it. He says, to put it more plainly, the desire for security and the feeling of insecurity, the desire for security and the feeling of insecurity are the same thing. To hold your breath is to lose your breath. A society based on the quest for security is nothing but a breath retention contest in which everyone is as taut as a drum and as purple as a beat. <laughs> he has, also has some trenchant things to say about uh, our, our uh, project of trying to improve this self of ours. He says, I can only think seriously of trying to live up to an ideal to improve myself if I am split in two pieces. There must be a good I who is going to improve the bad me. <clears throat> I who has the best intentions will go to work on wayward me, and the tussle between the two will very much stress the difference between them. Con consequently, I <clears throat> will feel more separate than ever, and so merely increase the lonely and cut off feelings which make me behave so badly. That's, <clears throat> that's enough. Um, everyone's <clears throat> fighting this hard struggle. 
but for the most part, we're doing it wrong. The, uh, the non uh, counterintuitive way that actually has some hope of changing our lives for the better is to open up to the inevitable discomfort that we're going to feel as human beings. We need somehow to find the willingness to go against the grain, to find a strategy other than running away. And that that requires a willingness. <clears throat> it's not enough simply to, to understand intellectually. We have to, we have to get it in our bones. I don't know any other way to do that than practice, than awareness. The starting point, though, is to realize that we're basically not really so willing. This isn't something that we really want to do. It's nice to talk about Zen practice. <clears throat> it's fun to read about it. Uh, used to be the main mode of Zen practice in the 1950s. Go to cocktail parties and tell stories, argue about koans. Anthony DeMello said something about this whole problem of, of being willing to change. He said, so the first thing, admit that your life is a mess. And second, this is a little bit tougher, okay? You ready? Here it is. You don't want to get out of it. You do not want to get out of the mess. Talk to any psychologist who's worth his name and he'll confirm that. The last thing a client wants is a cure. He doesn't want a cure, he wants relief. <clears throat> Eric Byrne, one of your great psychiatrists here in the United States, put it very graphically. He suggested you imagine a client who's up to his nose in a cesspool, okay? Yeah, he calls it liquid excrement. And he's coming to the doctor, and you know what he's saying to him? He's asking the doctor, could you help me so people won't make waves? The client doesn't want to get out of the cesspool. No, no, no. Get out. For heaven's sake, no. Just help me so they won't make waves. <clears throat> so how do we get out of the mess? How do we uh, work with our habitual reactions? How do we let go of our anxiety about some imagined future, our anxiety about what other people think about us, what kind of a <clears throat> picture we present to the world? How do we give ourselves more fully to whatever's in front of us? <clears throat> well, the first thing uh, that's helpful is to notice when discomfort arises. It's, it's, it's been called a compassionate alarm clock. Feel that feeling of dread in the pit of your stomach. Instead of turning away, turn towards it and look at it. <clears throat> it's always a body component. Anytime you're having any emotion whatsoever, it's in the body. It's not just in the mind. Open up to it. See what it is. The wonderful thing about all the time we spend facing the wall and doing zazen is that we gain the ability, we gradually learn to stay here. Stay still, not to spin off into thoughts. 
predictions and fantasies and regrets. Don't try to fix it. Don't try to create a different state of mind. Zazen doesn't work that way. If you're trying to create a state of mind, you're not really doing Zazen. You're not really looking. This, uh, this principle <clears throat> is uh, at the center of a, another form of psychotherapy which followed on after uh, DBT, Dialectical Behavior Therapy, and it's called ACT, which stands for Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. I actually think I gave a Dharma talk about it some years ago. And uh, there's something... Uh, You read just a little thing about ACT. I think this is in a book from a guy named Stephen Hayes, who's one of the primary uh, movers and shakers in, in this form of therapy. He says, ACT accepts the ubiquity of human suffering and does not seek to reduce pain or to produce a particular positive feeling. It is not about producing quick fixes or about using culturally sanctioned feel-good formulas and methods to reduce suffering. ACT seeks instead to reduce suffering by increasing people's vitality and ability to do what they want to do with their lives. <clears throat> this is uh, another way of saying what we said last week. If you imagine there is a snake in the room and you know there really isn't, walk into the room even though you're afraid. He says, this is what the ACT approach is all about. Accept and have what is there to be had, anxiety, anger, joy, memories, the whole package, while also staying committed to do what needs to be done to live a fulfilled, rich life guided by chosen values. People can choose to do things they enjoy and value regardless of what it is that they think or feel. <clears throat> How often do we find ourselves spending time trying to psych ourselves up to something, to do something that we could just do? Making a phone call. <clears throat> Asking someone for their phone number. Whatever. So many times where we think of it, we have the anxiety about it, and then we start struggling with the anxiety, where, in fact, you can just go straight to the action. The more you do that, the more the anxiety uh, finds its proper place in your life. And it does have a place. <clears throat> Fear keeps us from killing ourselves. <clears throat> I was reading some, something when I was preparing for this talk about uh, how some people uh, procrastinate. <clears throat> I, I've heard that's true. <laughs> and uh, anxiety kind of works. That it's, it's a strategy. I have to admit, it's a strategy that I myself have often used. Um, did a little better with this talk, which probably is a bad sign. but. Um, it's so hard to work on it before it's looming overhead. And once it looms overhead and you feel panicked, all of a sudden it's really possible to concentrate. So anxiety sort of works in that way. But what about those people who don't seem to procrastinate? <clears throat> you know, the first semester, week of the semester, they start working on that final paper that's going to be due in 12 weeks and do about a twelfth of it. And then gradually work their way week after week through um, it always seemed to me that those people would be totally free from anxiety. But what this article I was reading said was that it's not that they don't feel anxiety, it's just that it doesn't take very much anxiety to get them to move. <clears throat> so it may be that if you're a person like me who requires a fairly hefty dose of anxiety, um, 
you're just uh, you're not really tuned in to to what you're feeling. Can you can improve? <laughs> you can do a little better. <clears throat> he says anxiety need not stand in the way of doing. If anxious clients start to move down this path, they are likely to feel more anxiety at first. Eventually, they will pro eventually they will probably feel more enjoyment and less pain and anxiety. If that happens, it is considered a welcome byproduct of therapy. It is not an explicit goal of ACT. There's a, it's a number of images they use working with clients to sort of help them uh, buy into this idea of uh, accepting the fear, accepting the anxiety, accepting the discomfort, uh, not trying to push it out, get rid of it. And uh, here's one really good little uh, image. Suppose you come across someone standing in the middle of a pool of quicksand. There are no ropes or tree branches available. The only way you can help is by talking to them. That's sort of the position of a therapist. <clears throat> the person shouts, help, get me out, and is beginning to do what people do, struggling to get out. 99.9% .9 of the time, the effective action to take is to walk, run, step, hop, or jump out of trouble, but not with quicksand. <clears throat> Normally, to step out of something, you need to lift one foot and move the other one forward. With quicksand, that's a bad idea. Once one foot is lifted, all the person's weight rests on the other foot, half the previous surface area, and the downward pressure doubles. The person sinks deeper. As you watch, you see them starting to sink deeper. If you understand how quicksand works, you might shout at them to lie flat, spread-eagled, to maximize contact with the surface. The person, therefore, probably won't sink, fingers crossed, and might be able to roll to safety. <clears throat> Since the person is trying to get out of the quicksand, it goes against all their natural instincts to maximize body contact with it. Someone struggling to get out of the mud may never realize that the wise and safer action is to get with the mud. <coughs> Our own lives can be very much like this. The normal problem-solving methods that we use, sometimes repeatedly for years, actually for many people for their entire life from beginning to end, to try to deal with the struggles we face may themselves be part of the problem, just like someone trying to get free of the quicksand. Then he makes a, a really good point. This whole issue of accepting this discomfort, accepting anxiety. It says, we all hate being anxious. It's a horrible feeling. It feels overwhelmingly disturbing. And understandably, we try to keep it at bay by avoiding anything that might make us anxious or by doing things that help us feel safer in those situations where we feel anxious. And then he lays out a sentence. If you're not willing to have it, you will. What does it mean? If I'm not willing to be anxious, I will be anxious? Hmm. So if I'm not willing to be anxious, I will be anxious. I hate being anxious, so I guess I could give it a try. I'll try to be more willing to feel my anxiety so I won't be anxious. Okay. But if you decide you could be willing to be anxious in order to be rid of the anxiety, then you're not really willing to be anxious. And that will result in feeling more anxious. He says, this is not just mumbo jumbo. It might, might sound weird, not right, and yet it seems that it's true. If you're only willing to feel anxiety because you hope that by being willing to feel it, it will reduce your anxiety, then it cannot work. That is not the same as being willing to feel your anxiety. Why is that? 
because you're looking, you're looking ahead. You're waiting for your anxiety to pass. It's like wanting to come to awakening. Can't happen as long as you're wanting to do that. We really have to make a complete commitment. We really have to give up our agenda. We really have to buy completely in. It helps to talk about it. It helps to understand it. it. Really helps is to just do it again and again, imperfectly for sure, but devotedly. Noticing the mind straying into our concerns about the future or into our regrets about the past. Noticing that and coming back. This breath right now. Just the question. Just the awareness. Again and again. <clears throat> the changes that come are not directed. We're not trying to create something. It's just like the principle they have in ACT. It's a byproduct. Somebody once said, awakening is an accident, and Zazen makes you accident prone. says one final thing here. Notice when you start to feel the normal body response to unhelpful thoughts. Don't struggle or fight with the feelings and thoughts. Just let them be. And then his final point, it will pass. <clears throat> it's that third characteristic of existence. It's really hard to, to understand that in your gut, that things will pass. We always feel like whatever emotional state we're in is going to last forever. It's one of the reasons people take their own lives. It just seems like this will never change. But it does. Uh, an emotion that doesn't change is being kept alive by whatever strategy we're adopting to fight it off. Left alone, the uh, rule of thumb is any emotion will last no more than 90 seconds. <clears throat> this life of ours is fluid and changing. We can use that to rev up our insecurity and anxiety, or we can use it to change. It helps not to hold yourself to <clears throat> some sort of an ideal. A lot of people who practice Zen are mm, excellent students, and they uh, have lived a life of being complimented and praised for their diligence. And that can be a bad habit. If you focus on measuring up, then one mistake can send you into a tailspin. <clears throat> As I'm fond of saying, one aw shit will cancel out a hundred attaboys. It's better to stay in touch with the fact that we're just human beings. don't need to be special. There's nothing special about having Buddha nature. Evidently, everybody's got it. I found something written by uh, a guy named Robert Yielding. Apparently, he's part of the National Social Anxiety Center. <laughs> I 
thought that was the solar plexus. I, I, I can't take time to read the whole thing, but he has two, two little phrases that uh, he, he mentions that are helpful for uh, people who are <clears throat> feeling disconnected or different from others or not measuring up. The first one comes from Pema Chodron, and that's just uh, a practice, a simple practice she calls just like me. Just like me. Just like me, all others, all others feel anxious sometimes. Just like me, others here have felt anxious, insecure, or different. <clears throat> to realize this is a universal human phenomenon. The other phrase uh, he likes is just human. He says, uh, in one of his numerous writings, the Dalai Lama t retold the story of how he responded when someone asked him how he never appears anxious before the talks and meetings he has in front of large crowds. His response was sim simple, stating, just human. <clears throat> now this guy says, I've interpreted that to mean that despite the endless varieties of people he's talked with, they all share the same universal human experience and share the same essential nature just like him. We're all fallible and imperfect and will some make some social mishaps and even not be viewed positively by others at times. Fortunately, none of us are alone in this. <clears throat> when I hear him saying just human, uh, can also take it to mean I'm just human. don't have to be anything more than who I am. It's incredibly liberating to stop trying to stretch yourself into some contorted image that looks better than the reality. Trying to be an Instagram Buddhist. There's another uh, story about the Dalai Lama and anxiety. It's from a guy named Wes Nisker. <clears throat> He's uh, some sort of Buddhist teacher out in California. He says, a few years ago, I just happened to be on the same 18 seat plane as the Dalai Lama flying from Dar Dharamsala to New Delhi, a route where the updrafts from the Himalayan foothills can be vicious. In his autobiography, His Holiness talks about his fear of flying, and every time I glanced back at him on this particular flight, he was visibly anxious, staring intently out of the window while fingering his mala and silently reciting a mantra. <clears throat> Just the fact that the Dalai Lama was on the plane made me feel safer. But seeing his nervousness was also somehow comforting, making my own fear of flying seem less personal. <clears throat> and then he says, becoming more comfortable with fear begins with our acknowledgement that these strong sensations we feel are biologically programmed a biologically programmed reaction to some perceived threat. The Buddha called all such organic reactions, quote, underlying tendencies, and said that the way to work with them is to realize this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. If we understand fear as an evolved survival mechanism, we gain some perspective and perhaps some release from our identification with the feeling. <clears throat> We might even arrive at a place where we can bow down to fear, seeing it as a friend who is looking out for our very life. So much of our anxiety concerns uh, not pain that we might feel, 
although I guess maybe it becomes emotional pain, but just fear of other people having a bad opinion of us. <clears throat> I remember when I uh, uh, was doing the steps of AA, one of them is uh, you make a list of everybody you resent. <laughs> I had a very large list. And when I looked through it, I found that everyone I had a resentment of, there was something that had happened with them where I appeared in a bad light. That the fact that they saw my not so great side um, sort of snapped me into that <clears throat> feeling of resentment. Roshi Kaplow was on that list, <laughs> along with my dad. I once gave a talk about resentment, and uh, at the time my father was visiting. And uh, he was in a wheelchair, or he needed a wheelchair for, to, to see the talk. And uh, so did Roshi Kaplow. So the two of them were in wheelchairs on either side of the doorway as I sat with my back to the altar. <laughs> it was great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> But that's another place where uh, we can really clear the air quite a bit if we begin to see how unnecessary it is to measure up to anybody else's idea. Um, I've often quoted what uh, the great physicist Richard Feynman said. He wrote a whole book and the title was, What Do You Care What Other People Think? So I'm going to read a rant by that guy, Anthony DeMello, I've read from before. I've probably read this rant before. But it just <clears throat> puts a stake in it. it. says, a small-time businessman, 55 years old, is sipping a beer at a bar somewhere, and he's saying, well, look at my classmates. They really made it. The idiot. What does he mean, they made it? They've got their names in the newspaper. Do you call that making it? One is president of the corporation. The other has become the chief justice. Somebody else has become this or that. Monkeys, all of them. Who determines what it means to be a success? This stupid society. The main preoccupation of society is to keep society sick. And the sooner you realize that, the better. Sick, every one of them. They're loony, they're crazy. You become president of the lunatic asylum, and you're proud of it, even though it means nothing. Being president of a corporation has nothing to do with being a success in life. <clears throat> Having a lot of money has nothing to do with being a success in life. You're a success in life when you wake up. Then you don't have to apologize to anyone. You don't have to explain anything to anyone. You don't give a damn what anyone thinks about you or what anybody says about you. You have no worries, you're happy. That's what I call being a success. Having a good job or being famous or having a great reputation has absolutely nothing to do with happiness or success. Nothing. It is totally irrelevant. All he's really worried about is what his children will think about him, what the neighbors will think about him, what his wife will think about him. He should have become famous. Our society and culture drill that into our heads day and night. People who made it, made what? Made asses of themselves because they drained all their energy getting something that was worthless. They're frightened and confused. They're puppets like the rest. Look at these, look at them strutting across the stage. Look how upset they get if they get a stain on their shirt. <laughs> Do you call that a success? Look at how frightened they are at the prospect they might not get reelected. Do you call that success? They are controlled, they're so controlled and so manipulated. They're unhappy people, they are miserable people, they don't enjoy life, they are constantly tense and anxious. <clears throat> Do you call that human? And you know why that happens? For only one reason. They identified with some label. They identified the I with their money or their job or their profession. That was their error. So poignant to talk with someone who's maybe in their 40s or 50s and they're, they're feeling bad 
because they've never accomplished much. They don't have a job, a high paying job, or they're not a professional success. Inevitably comparing themselves to other people. But what, what would be, what would be great at the age of 40 or 50 would be to be at peace with yourself. The ability to be present with other people, to be able to offer genuine sympathy, to be able to do what needs to be done in spite of your anxiety or reluctance, to be able to live out of your values. Those things have nothing to do with career. There's nothing wrong with a career. <clears throat> suppose there's probably nothing wrong with becoming president of the asylum. But if that's your goal, you're going at it the wrong way. It's not going to end well. need to realize that worry serves a purpose, it reminds us of something we may need to do, and beyond that, it serves no purpose whatsoever. There's a uh, movie uh, with a script written by David Mamet in which a character, I think played by Gene Hackman, says, worry is interest paid in advance on a debt that never comes due. <clears throat> I had to look that up to get it exactly right, and it turns out it's really a reworking of something that Mark Twain has apparently said <clears throat> quite a number of years before. Mark Twain also said, I am an old man and have known a great many troubles, most of which never happened. <laughs> this is so important to find a way to work with things as they are, to work with our habits. It's, it's, it's so wonderful that there is a way of working that, that, that works, <clears throat> to understand it. And it's not trying to manipulate things, it's not trying to create a specific change, it's just giving ourselves to our lives doing what needs to be done. We do it for the sake of others, because unless we're present, we can't really be available, we can't really help, and of course we do it for ourselves. Because over time, anxiety does diminish. <clears throat> slowly, inevitably. Which means that our stress diminishes. Which means that our energy increases. There's room for joy. It's, 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 really, it's really good news. You know, People, people say that Buddhism is a pretty depressing religion. And you can understand why, right? Life is suffering. Nothing stays the same. You don't even exist. <laughs> I read somewhere, Buddha said, the past is gone, the future is not here, there is no present. I didn't get you one. <laughs> it's, uh, it's actually good news to, to, to have a teaching that explains things as they are, that makes sense, that's consistent, that's reasonable, and then to have a way of working with what we've got. It's not based on hope or dreams. 
It's just practical and simple. <clears throat> we're not called upon to become something that we're not. The uh, Zen teacher John Tarrant said, we are all of us flowers. What kind of flower has no, is not our business. Our job is just to blossom. Okay, I've talked long and our time is up and we'll stop now and recite the four vows.